<laughs> well, hi, folks. Um, I thought to kick this off, I would read an excerpt. And of course, I have to be careful because the book is all about bad words. And you don't want to say some of them at all. And you don't want to say any of them too much. And yet, I hope this is going to be relatively diverting. And so I've chosen, if I may ask, this is from the beginning of the chapter on that word, and I will be as tasteful as possible. But the beginning of the chapter goes like this. There's a funny little thing that happens in English. You're at the zoo checking out some exotic looking little horse or animal, wild asses of some sort, likely from somewhere in Asia. When your child asks what that horsey is, you stifle a giggle as you tell them. It's an ass, an ass that you might ride no less, whereupon you'd be doing so perched on your own, well, hee hee. What's with that anyway? Why are certain equines called the same thing as buttocks? It is, as you might suppose, an accident. Ass referring to an animal goes way, way back. With similar words referring to animals that people made miserable. But ass referring to buttocks started as a fortuitously similar word, ars, which has a different origin story entirely. For Brit, ars still has a certain currency. Recall the famous moment in Pygmalion or My Fair Lady where Cockney Eliza gives her origins away at the races with move your buddy ars. Ars shows itself confidently in ancient English. A nice early example is in early Middle English in 1325 in a poem. In a smock, it fole And what that meant was she hadn't not a smock for foul arse to hide. As in, if we may, she didn't have a smock to hide her dirty posterior. That sentence is a very interesting one in many ways, but note that the ass word contained an R. So a key aspect, so to speak, of British English is that R's have a way of dissolving. Not when the R's at the beginning of the word, nobody in England calls rabbits abbots, but when the R's at the end of a word, or even close to the end, watch out, what began as car became ca, park became park, or at the end of a syllable, Carson pronounced cost. It's key to what distinguishes British from American English. Note that tassel and bust feel earthier than parcel and burst. That's because they started as arless mispronunciations of exactly those words, parcel and burst. That's because of that. Horse, hoss is a similar case from America. And in the same way, ass was a slangier arse over there. The result, was that likeness between the word for a horsey and the word for one's rump. And people were likely sensing it as early as Shakespeare. They're nuances of the Times linguistic scene that we'll never be quite sure of, but goodness, he named his comic relief figure Bottom and then turned him into a donkey. So, I am such a tender ass if my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. To suppose that the reference here wasn't anatomical would seem a bit grim. Moreover, donkey only noses into English in the 1700s. There is no ye old merry donkey. The word doesn't exist then. Before that, donkeys were referred to as asses. There isn't a thing separating a donkey from one of those similarly medium-sized zoo critters from Siberia. But at a certain point, it felt improper to refer to the trotting of an ass or the riding of one. One referred to someone making an ass of themselves less because of something so awful about donkeys than because of the accidental resemblance between their name and that of a butt. So in the early 20th century, Booth Tarkington's literary reputation was roughly that of J.K. Rowling's and Jonathan Francis today. But nowadays he's largely and justifiably forgotten. Yet he's relevant to this book in a single thing he wrote. In 1898, he reported to his parents that his first impression upon becoming famous was that I felt like a large gray ass and looked like it. If ours for buttocks didn't become identical to ass for horses, he'd have had no reason to liken his embarrassment to feeling like an equine. What, after all, is so definitionally embarrassing about being a modestly sized horse? So that's from Nine Nasty Words. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, first question. What's your favorite word in the book? Which one do you, which one do you like to use? I'll say it one time. I really <laughs> like motherfucker. I have always loved that word. I decided to devote the final chapter to it alone and not just F-U-C-K. I like the rhythm of it. It has a weird um, racial 
story. It has a nice flavor. It allows you to teach little linguistic lessons here and there. There's a whole lot in it. There's a whole book only about that word, which is dear and amusing, but gets to be a bit much. But somebody came up with a good 175 pages on that word. And there is a reason. I only do about seven. But yeah, that is my favorite of the whole bunch. Cool. Um, so you, you mentioned in the book, or, or the book is kind of about the evolution of American swear words, I guess. Uh, and, and you mentioned, you start off talking about words about, swear words about religion, then, then it moves to the body, then it moves to words about groups, I would say. Uh, one, one way you illustrate this is that we can say words like damn and hell today, even on a program like this, and it just feels a little bit salty, but kind of the words about the body, we might have to spell out words about groups uh, we can't spell out or utter at all, really, in, in polite mm -hmm. conversation, I guess. Um, I want to, but I wanted to talk first about the words, the religious words. Mm -hmm. Another way you illustrate how they, how destigmatized they become is that, like, section about Mitt Romney saying golly gosh or jeepers, mm -hmm. or I don't know if he says jeepers, but he seems to have, a, <laughs> he seems to say gosh a lot. It's fun to imagine him saying it, yeah. And it, you know, makes him, makes him sound like Ned Flanders, you say in the book, That's... I think. Um, and I, what I was wondering is, do, is that, are the words, are the proof, is the, is religious words rising to the level of profane? Is that something that's specific to America? Or is it, you know, does that happen in other cultures as well? If you look at other cultures, actually, there's a kind of a parameter. Some cultures are inclined to have profanity be about religion, and that's hardly limited to Anglophone cultures. Some cultures are more inclined to their profanity being about the body, the things that we think of today as the kind of classic four-letter word. And then some cultures combine the two, and that is definitely Anglophone. But yeah, you can be a culture where the main action in terms of saying a really bad word that might get you smacked is about taking the Lord's name or Jesus' name in vain, as people used to say. Speaking of like different different profanity in different cultures, there's a something that makes purchasing the book worth it uh, on its own is the uh, is the little table of um, uh, Russian swear words that are related to <laughs> for the them. It's about happy. the body. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's, uh, so something to get. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, what do you think caused the what do you think caused the shift in the U.S. of swear words, you know, shifting from religion to being about the body. Well, religion to being about the body happens in especially England, starting in the 14 and then really the 1500s. And there's controversy as to how it happened, but words that started out as salt, you know, there was never a time when F-U-C-K wouldn't get you kind of giggling. Words that were salty became words that were profane. And it was partly the Reformation and a new emphasis upon a personal relationship, not only to God, but a concern with the flesh being inferior to the soul. There's more privacy in architecture and in just the way people thought of themselves starting at that time. Big buildings have more rooms starting in the 1400s. You're alone more. Excretion and sex are much less public than they used to be. And so once society starts to have that sense of individuality, what would much, much later start to be called personal space, there is the idea that there's something wrong with the body that you keep it to yourself. And next thing you know, F-U-C-K, S-H-I-P are really bad words that you sometimes have to work to find in print as opposed to the jokes that they were before that. And, and so, and similarly, I mean, the, uh, the shift from, the shift, you know, to, uh, slurs about groups rising to profanity, you, you, you see a cultural shift there as well, correct? Yeah, and it's, it's actually the most interesting one in the book as far as I'm concerned. You could write a book like this and just stop with the F-U-C-K words. But it occurred to me that 
the truth is that nowadays those words are not profane in a way that an anthropologist would recognize, especially people under, I would say, about 70. I'm not saying under 30, I'm oh, under 70. I use F-U-C-K quite prolifically, yes, including around my children. And I don't think that I'm unusual in that, whereas my parents were much less likely to use it. And that's because in my book, and I'm 55, I just don't see it as profane the way I know it was until relatively recently. It's salt, but a society always is concerned about or uncomfortable about something. And I think that it was predictable that after the 60s, after the counterculture, the idea was let it all hang out. You, you don't dance in steps anymore. You don't wear hats. You don't wear girdles. You don't wear petticoats. It's an informal culture that we live in, a whole new way of speaking. And a lot of that meant that the old sense, you don't talk about your body or what comes out of it, was going to fall away. But what else is society worried about? And especially after the 60s, it became extremely incorrect, and this is a good thing, to slur groups of people. And so what one knew is that after that, what was considered profane was going to be those words. And we have a classification. We think cursing is hell and damn. Then the N-word is a slur. But then again, we, we call tomatoes fruits. I mean, we call tomatoes vegetables, even though we know they're fruits. In the same way, we call certain things slurs, but the spot that they occupy in our current linguistic culture is the spot of the profane. And so we just have different profanity. It's not that people use profanity more. The old profane words are now the salty, but we have new profanity and it's about slurring groups. I wonder how much of that is um, is based on how much of the loss in um, emphasis, you know, the, the loss in shock value is based just on repetition, and and how and how do you? I mean, this is kind of a circular. I don't know, but how do you? How does the word lose its shock value or lose its impact through without you being able to say it? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Everything does lose its impact over time when it was originally meant to be strong or to create an effect or to make people jump. And that's actually why you can give the basic curse words, but almost all of them have some sort of reinforced version that you use just as much. And so damn is one thing, but goddamn is just as common. And really, it's just a way of using damn and trying to strengthen it. And, you know, one could go on. So I already said the word motherfucker. That helps with F-U-C-K. Notice that you say bullshit. Why a bull? Why a horse? It's because it reinforces that particular word. I could do that with all of these words, including the ones that I'm not going to say. And that's because as they lose their power, you add something on. So that's a natural thing that happens with all words in a language and you know, verses are no exception. We've got a great question from the audience here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one to you. Would, would you say that secu secularism is attributed to the relaxation of religious controls on the colloquial use of language? For the longest time in Western history, the church controlled what was written and who wrote it. Definitely. Yes, that has a lot to do with it. And so even if it wasn't the church, you could say that it's the general leading mores of society. And so F-U-C-K doesn't appear in a dictionary for 200 years until the mid-1960s. If you just used dictionaries, you wouldn't know that word existed. And yet through various other methods, you can make it clear that the word definitely was being used by normal people all the time. Yeah, there were controls. And that kind of control from religious authorities in particular, of course, lessens over time. And the only question would have been why usage of language, including profanity, wouldn't have changed along with that. Yes. So for, for some reason, I keep skipping over all my other questions and just my eyes keep going to the questions about the N word, I guess. Um, That's okay. So, and wh why, I don't know, but I guess we're just gonna go there. Um, okay. That, um, so can you walk people through how the N word became unsayable or un unutterable in any context? Really? Well, there's a very interesting history there because even say 30 years ago, there was of course the slur. And the idea was that you don't utter the slur against black people. But the idea back then was that you could refer to the word in passing conversation, usually to criticize it, and you didn't want to overdo it, you would do it with taste, but you could refer to the word. That's changed of late. That change starts in the late 90s. 
and the new idea becomes that the word shouldn't be uttered for any reason at all. And that is where the word goes from something we call a slur into the profane, being treated in the exact same way as damn and hell, and then all of those sexy and excretion words are. It's become a kind of taboo word in society. So that word, there's a reason people have written whole books about that word, because while that has happened to it, that's happened to the slur, the word also long, long ago, and not just with rap music, as many people seem to think, centuries before that, became an in-group term of affection among, in particular, Black men. And when pronounced with the sound system of Black English, it really became what I think of as a different word entirely. It means buddy. It isn't the slur at all. Not everybody is hear it that way, though. And so it seems this is one word that white people use and then black people use, but white people shouldn't use it. How come black people can use it? Some people ask. My sense of it is that black people are using a different word entirely. And there's even more. You know, there are um, usages of that word where it basically becomes a pronoun. There are usages of that word now among young white men who grew up listening to hip hop and think of the buddy version of the word as something they want to use because that music has been in their ears all of their lives and they have a certain superficial affection for black culture. And so they use it to mean buddy among one another. And then people from the outside hear them using the slur. It's a very multifarious word, endlessly fascinating and troubling in many ways word. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you think it's the fact that that word has become the you know, the unsayable word culturally is probably a good thing. Do you think that, do you think it's a good thing culturally um, that it, that it has so much power, I guess, that it's, that it's unsayable? I mean, I, I know, I, I, I can't remember if um, it says this in the book or if it's, or if it's in side reading, you know, if it, if you said mm -hmm. it in some side reading that I did, there's quite right. prolific internet, uh, <laughs> internet articles available. Um, mm -hmm. quite a Googleable guy you are, but uh, you, you tell stories about academics kind of using the N-word as a point of reference and losing their jobs or, or using a similar sounding word and, you know, going up before the, before an ethics panel, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I, clearly that rubs you the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. Well, in the book, it doesn't because there are two me's. There's the jolly linguist me and there's the cranky race commentator me. So in this book, I just basically try to describe and I have a paragraph where I say that of course I'm a human being and I'm black myself and I have some judgments, but that's not my place here. Oh, so However, yes, <laughs> these, side, these side writings that you're talking about, yeah, I have a very uncuddly view of that. I don't like where the word has gone over the past 20 years. I don't like the idea that you're not allowed to utter the word even just to refer to it, even if what you're doing is criticizing it. I find that to be, get ready folks, it's performed delicacy. It implies that there could possibly be a sequence of sounds that would make me you know, jump onto my bed and start crying and thinking about slavery and Jim Crow. I think a lot of people think of it as a kind of strength, the idea being you will not say this word, we insist upon it. And if you say it, you're gonna get in trouble. I see what they mean. But to me, the flip side of that is, there's a word you can say that can destroy me. And I guess I'm just too arrogant to be comfortable with that. And so I don't want people to use the slur. That would be terrible. The idea that if you use it in passing to describe it, you get fired. I don't like it because it implies that I'm a baby, but that is not the view of most people in my position. But I would be being fake if I didn't say that's how I felt. Nine nasty words is not about anything that glum. But yes, you read me all over the place expressing that view in places other than my happy little language book. Um, so, Oh, here, here's another another audience question. So there, there's an excerpt of the book that appeared in the New York Times about the, I mean, it's basically an excerpt about the N-word chapter. Yeah, they, they published um, it pretty, pretty much the way it is, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, Bob from the audience wants to know if you got any feedback from that article, if, you, if there was any, if it caused any uproar. <laughs> you know, the truth is I, um, many people who read the excerpt seem to think that that was the whole chapter. 
They thought that was all there was. And the excerpts didn't include the, the black in-group usage of it or all sorts of other aspects. And I think some people didn't understand that the excerpt was only one part, but no, there hasn't been blowback. And I'm gonna tell you something that it's gonna sound like false humility, but it isn't. I am mystified at how positive the feedback for that has been, because for me, it wasn't the main reason I wrote. And I don't really feel like I said anything that was all that interesting. That is genuinely the truth. I just gave the basic history of the word. I gave some personal recollections of me watching the Jeffersons. And, you know, I'm not the only black person who watched the Jeffersons in the 70s. It was just this dolly part of one chapter out of the book. And people seem to really like it, which I carry with me. I'm very happy that people liked it. But to me, it was just, what's, why is that, that one so, so interesting? But that word clearly really gets people going. And I completely, completely understand why. As I've said, people have devoted whole books to it. But I wrote Nine Nasty Words, frankly, because I like the word F-U-C-K. And I thought, well, that- Hello, book, finally getting back to you. <laughs> but the, the book itself, that's just- oh, okay. Oh, somebody How else- are you? One, one, one second here. There we go. <laughs> that word is what really interested me, but I thought nobody wants to read a whole book about that. Why maybe do a, a book about all of the bad words? Then I thought to myself, well, the bad words now include the N word and some others like that. Let's add that on. I would have done that if I were white as butter. You know, I, the N word was not the focus of it. I think that chapter is probably getting more attention than any other, and that's fine with me. But to me, that requires an adjustment because I thought of it, I'm going to say it one time, I thought of it, my, my children were calling it this. It's the fuck book. That's what I thought it was. But I can tell that for many people, it's the N-word book. And great, you know, just I had fun writing it. Well, okay, so here, here's a, look, I got to dig it up here, but here's a question about the F-word that relates to the N-word. And I'm, I, I'm just going to. All right, so in, in the chapter on the F word, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a librarian in, you know, semi-rural Ohio. I'm, not, I'm, I'm using the F word, okay? Uh, in, in the chapter on the F word, you write that in 1928, the word had the deepest stigma of any in language. This was so severe that Maxwell Perkins, who's Hemingway and Fitzgerald editor, can't utter it when he's discussing uh, the first draft of Farewell to Arms, and he has to write it down. That's a cute story, also illustrative. Um, I don't know who like Max Perkins' equivalent is today, but probably like Bill Clegg or Binky Urban or something. Mm -hmm. they probably, they're probably dropping F bombs on the subway and everywhere yes. else. <laughs> uh, so, what, what my question is, is you know, the reason they're they're dropping the F-bombs left and right is because of a cultural shift. And yet we're in this moment now where, you know, it's unimaginable to say the N-word. What what does it take, for, you know, culturally for that word to lose its power for, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe it's those white guys who are referring to, you know, the young white guys referring to each other with the kind of GA version. Mm -hmm. the word maybe maybe them using it casually like that causes the hard er version to lose its power i mean what do you think culturally well i think that um with the ga versus the er version what we're seeing it looks so loaded and interesting to us because we're in our own context but that happens with slurs all over the world that something starts as a term of abuse and then because part of being intimate is bringing one another all onto the same level, you use the term of abuse as an in-group word, as a way of you know, having a beer together, as a way of signaling affection and comfort with each other. That's by no means just something that happens in English. You find that around the world. What's unusual is if that doesn't happen to some extent. But the difference between a guy who you know, can't write the F word, and can't say the F word and put it on a calendar and make somebody read it, and this is a hard drinking Manhattanite editor running around with people like Ernest Hemingway. And today, the fact that, we are, in the, that. No. Yeah, we are in the exact same place with the N-word, it's the exact same taboo. It can be seen as an advance in itself. And whatever my quibbles about how extreme we've gotten about it, I would say I would rather see a society that is that uptight about slurs against people than a society that's that uptight 
about making a reference to sexual intercourse. I think to me, today's version is evidence of a certain moral and intellectual development in society compared to the way people felt a hundred years ago. A lot of my kind of sidebar issues about exactly how we handle the N-word are the natterings of some one person. And when we pull the camera back, what's really happened is that profanity is about not hurting people rather than not referring to what you do in the bathroom. The first thing for me makes more sense than the second thing. Yeah, me, me too. Um, I, I guess So I guess maybe we have to move to a place in society where we actually don't, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, or, or, may, or maybe it, maybe it's we just, you know, something more terrible comes along. I mean, what do, what do you think? That, be. Yeah. What do you think the swear words of the future will be? Do you, do you see any movement of words gaining yeah. power now? Do you know what I um, mean? Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a sci-fi person. And so that's not a frame of mind I slip into easily, but I think pretty soon from now, I even thought about addressing these issues in the book, but I decided to keep it slimmer. There will be issues about body size and body image that I think are going to in inspire a certain amount of linguistic carefulness such that terms may become profane. That could also become true about trans issues. I imagine that in 20 years that will be the case too, that we're treating certain terms as so utterly verboten that we're in a territory where it's beyond you called me a dirty word and it's become that we have a curse that we don't use. It could start happening about class, but I think if we get beyond those kinds of personal categories, it's gonna be what concerns people and worries people and makes them uncomfortable. That could be, for example, climate change. You know, I, that's hard to imagine, but if it gets to the point that we really are seeing that the planet is becoming an unrecognizably different place and we're in trouble, there will be people who don't want to talk about that. There will be ways you're supposed to talk about that. Profanity could emerge around that sort of thing. I can imagine a sci-fi writer might come up with something like that. It's whatever society is hung up about. And so whatever our hangups are in 100 years, there will be profanity surrounding that. I doubt if there will ever not be profanity. It's just what what will the profanity be about? So we got another, we've got another audience question. It's a bit of a mouthful. Oh, we've got a couple audience questions here, so, but I'm, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, I, Jason says, I've thought about the history of this particular word as well. Having taken some Latin, page 176, you say that the word is etymologically, etymolo etymologically dull. However, although Latin speak speakers use the simplicity of the word black, uh, to those with black skin, they did not refer to themselves in such a way. They instead used geography as identification from Rome, from et cetera. It seems that uh, that it, them using the word black as a form of othering to reduce one uh, to the color of their skin other than where they're from as Latin speakers did for themselves. Does this tradition of othering still carry forth with the reappropriation of the word as well? Is it affirming that in the use of the word, we are other crowd? Othering, wow. <laughs> I get where that perspective comes from. And under that analysis, you're generally referring to people based on where they're from. Then to come up with a reference to them that's on the color of their skin, is an othering. That is our way of looking at it. But if you think about people around the world, presumably from the beginning of when there have been homo sapiens, I, I can't think of any society where this doesn't happen. Referring to people by broad stroke classification, such as the color of their skin or the length of their limbs, or what their hair is like, people do that in general. And so othering I would say it's not interesting that, that they use niger and they refer to the black skin. I would call that uninteresting because it's so common. Now, whether it's right is a whole issue, but in terms of thinking, well, what did, where does that N-word term come from? It ends up not coming from, say, a word for spoon or a word for sunset, whereas the F word that has six letters in it and that's used to refer to gay men starts out meaning a bundle of sticks. That to me is more interesting than the N word starting as a word for black skin. But I take I take your point. 
It's just what perspective you use on this, this othering and how unusual it is as an aspect of human cognition. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so he, he follows up. I think, I think that, a, that any identifying term that one does not choose themselves has the potential to become profane. Contemporarily, uh, misgendering, you know, I mean, he, he compares it to misgender. So I, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, it becomes profane when all of society or what's considered polite society join in the idea that the word should not be said. And that's not something that happens, once again, that's not something that happens in all societies. And so it's easy for us to be American and to think, well, of course, educated white people are going to start being almost more upset by the word than we are, because that we have seen happening. And I, even at 55, I have never known in America where that wasn't at least approximately true. I missed the time when the word was freely used by ordinary people, or at least I was a very small child. But if you think about many other societies now, they do not police slurs in the way that we do. And frankly, I think we're ahead of them in that way. But in many of these places, using you know open othering descriptions of that kind is considered pretty ordinary whether or not people who are having these terms applied to them choose it. So profane among the people themselves, perhaps. But in terms of society as a whole, America is advanced in that it's at least its intelligentsia ends up taking the side of the oppressed in cases like these, even if it's only about something superficial, such as names. This is not to say that everything is perfect, that the oppressed are, take complete responsibility for everything, but it's newer. This is a very post 60s way of being a nation and having a, a profanity. It's part of why I find it interesting enough to, to write a book about it. All right, so I wanna, I wanna shift gears a little bit and ask a, ask a little bit softer question from a colleague of mine. Um, in several places in the book, and thank you, Brian, for the question. In several places in the book, you mention how comedians and writers in the past have used profanity. Uh, he's wondering if there are any writers or comedians working today who you think their use of profanity is, you know, worth noting, fun and unique. That, some, that a scholar might talk about 30 years from now? That's an interesting question. Who curses articulately? Yeah. Um, and I mean, the quote unquote dirty words such as damn and hell and then the other ones that I won't say because I've said them enough. They're so common that I'm thinking, you know, most comedians that I watch on Netflix or something like that are using them quite fluently. And, you know, we don't think of them as... As, as dirty. So I'm think of somebody who nevertheless uses those words articulately. Ali Wong is pretty good at it. That's somebody who just kind of comes, comes to mind. The truth is Eddie Murphy was, Richard Pryor and then Eddie Murphy were very good cursors. I know those are now older references, but Eddie Murphy in particular was working right on the cusp of the time where slurs became profane. So the, the way he used those, however you felt about it, was articulate. And then also the way he used previous profanities was very good, was very, was very deft in that way. But yeah, we live, we live in a different time. And so I don't listen for the profanity as much as I might because I don't think of the word profane. But yeah, people can be salty well. And there, some people are better at that than others. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if a comedian came along and was using the truly profane words we're talking about, and and man and managed to be funny, right. then maybe that then maybe that's the moment where the words start to lose its power. <laughs> right, know? and I don't and, think we're it, at that moment yet. Right, we yeah. are not there yet. It's hard to it's hard to imagine in, like an Eddie Murphy routine from the I don't know eighties coming out today, today and being it would it would make news in the wrong way today. I yes, think. so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So if you, you mentioned a few times in the book that your daughters have caught on that they're not supposed to say certain swear words, and yet you kind of swear in front of them pretty regularly. I, I do also. I've got a sailor's <laughs> mouth. I've got, I've got a young daughter, five years old. Um, and I've noticed, you know, there were a few times, like as a three-year-old, where 
she kind of accidentally dropped the f bomb in front of my mom or something, and that's not good. <laughs> but then, but then she kind of caught on, you know, like maybe at four or so. There are just some words you don't say. Why, why do you suppose that is? Because I, I personally, I don't believe I've really edited myself. Mm-hmm. I don't believe I've really come down, you know, like, you know, come down as a disciplinarian and said, no, you don't say that or anything. But I've just mm-hmm. noticed she she edits herself way more than I do. Why, why do you suppose that is? Language is so not what we can't help thinking it is. And it's our brains are on writing. So to my students. We think the language is what we see on the page. And what we see on the page is, for one thing, a dictionary where words have these, these clean little definitions. And so we think that speaking is knowing what the words mean and figuring out how to put them in order. But there's so much more than that to words, such as their social indication. And so kids don't hear us saying, say, F-U-C-K, and then thinking, well, there is a word like sun and raisin and pick me up, and I'm going to use that too. That's not how they hear it. They pick up that it's a word that adults only use among one another, that the word is never used towards them, that you don't look them in the eye and say it. And they couldn't tell you this, but they know, okay, that's a grown-up word, just like nobody gives them bourbon. They see you drinking whatever you like. They never get any. You don't have to say you can't have any bourbon. They don't want it because they've never been given any, and it's just not an issue. It's the same way with this kind of profanity. So I found with mine, they know. I never told them. They they know the words that daddy uses. They'll they'll repeat them to me with a smile, but they know that they are not supposed to use them. And I've mentioned that once or twice. I've said, don't use these words at school. But they also don't use them around me, or one of them, the younger and slightly naughtier one, will do a string of them looking at me with a smile because she knows I find it funny. And so she's doing it in quotation marks. I had to disappoint her the other day and say, we're not going on the trip that I said we were gonna go on for a couple of weeks. And she whispered into the phone, that she knew that she wasn't supposed to say that. Now, the thing is, there are words that I would never say around her, where if they said them, I would need therapy. That's the quote unquote slur. That's our profanity as opposed to somebody 70 years ago who would have been appalled to hear their child say S-H-I-T before they were 35. So it's, we have profanity, and I've got it too. It's just that it's those words. They don't know those words, for example. They don't hear me using them, and they're not going to. They're going to pick them up in school. But those are the profanities, not the things about the body, and certainly not damn and hell. Yeah, yeah do, you, do you think... Um... When do you think kids of, of their generation will pick up? I mean, you know, what, at what age do you, I'm just curious. I mean, cause it's just hard to imagine even a kid, you know, I don't know saying- You mean you when know, will like, they- Like, like when the, will what's they, that? You mean when will they start using- When, the when, will, when will they when will they hear it? You oh, know, like yeah. the N word or, you know, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, it's, well, it's remember, a, sorry. I mean, I hadn't thought of this as a question beforehand. No, it's but, an issue. They're going to hear it in music. I mean, once they oh, start listening yeah, to yeah. rap, they're going to hear it all the time. And they're going to get a very rich sense of how it's used, what it means, what the spread of usages is. And yeah, that's when they're going to get it. But that will mostly be away from us. They're, it's going to be a peer group issue, learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... So the F bomb, I, I referred to, you know, my daughter there saying the F bomb. F bomb happens to be my favorite, you know, slang term for F word, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I, I noticed, you know, F bomb wasn't in the book. So I'm wondering um, how you picked the the kind of etymologies that you use, you know, because certainly, you know, the F-U-C-K word. Uh, well, you, you go back to 1475, and the first one is, uh, yeah, I can't even, you know, but it's that gibberish, <laughs> the gibberish yeah. word there. Um, but and, but then as you get into the present day, there's a, you know, there's a million different variations like, like F-bomb, E-F-F, you know, I mean, I don't know. So how mm-hmm. did you choose which, uh, which slang versions to include in the book? 
you mean how did I choose which profanities or how did I choose how to record? How did you, when, when you were mapping out the, the history of the swear words, mm -hmm. how did you, how did you pare that down, I guess? Well, I think, um, to be honest, the original idea was that my agent, who was very good, said it ought to be called nine nasty words because of the alliteration i mean this is how the sausage is made folks uh, <laughs> yeah makes sense and so then it becomes well what are the nine and i said well we have to get the slurs in because i think that's the most important point to make today and when you kind of counted them all out it meant that there wasn't really room for damn and hell and you know you kind of figure those aren't curses anyway so at first i was just going to leave those out really there are 12 words in the book nine nasty yeah. just sounds good it's 12. And then I thought, no, I need to have damn and hell because I want to hang all of this on a history of cursing. And so instead of putting them in alphabetical order, nothing is duller than a book that takes things by alphabetical order. Once you get that C, you're bored. There has to be a story. And, and so I thought, well, let's too. start with the blasphemy and then squeeze as much as I can out of them, and that, which was fun, trying to make those chapters work, and then go through the sex ones, et cetera, and then have the relative surprise of the N-word and some very unfortunate words referring to women and to gay men, have those be at the end. The idea being to keep the string taut, so to speak. And so then it all pretty much explained itself. I think many of us, you know, if you're asked, name some fruit, the first thing you say is apples and pears, despite the fact that most of us don't like those fruits that much, they're just first. So with damn and hell, it's always damn first and then hell. Then with the rest of them, the order was a little bit more arbitrary. I like the F-bomb and stuff, let's have that third and then you keep going and then with the slurs well golly which one of those is going to be first and then I decided that um why don't we end it with mother uh, because I just like that one and it, it'll be short so it all just kind of fell together I wanted a historical progression and that's what, what the book follows yeah, I wanted to ask you about some pop culture references in the book um First, I want uh, you, I noticed you mentioned the cartoon Flip the Frog a couple times. Yes. Um, how, how did you come across that? What, and... what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, I, I, I looked it up on YouTube. But it's interesting stuff. I, weird. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Very, very strange. And I just wondered, uh, I mean, did do, do you have a background studying pop culture or, I, or, or did you... I don't call it that, but yeah. <laughs> it's I a am, curiosity, I'm, maybe. <laughs> I am obsessed with vintage American popular culture and its development on all levels, radio, comic books. And I really, really like cartoons. I've never gotten over my love of Looney Tunes. It's a lot of how I bond with my kids. I, and I love old cartoons in particular, including the stuff that you're scraping up from the floor, the stuff that nobody liked then. And Nobody really likes it now, but it becomes fascinating because it's 100 years old. And Flip the Frog is, um, you know, once Mickey Mouse comes out, of course, there are like six knockoffs of Mickey Mouse. Flip the Frog was one of them and one of the worst. But the cartoons are kind of loopy and a little bit dark and very sexy in ways. And so if you're a me and you've been studying these cartoons for what's becoming my whole life, you know about Flip the Frog. And it's at the point where this is going too far in the weeds, so I'm just going to go this much further into it. There ahead, is a crazed idiot, and I shouldn't call him that, except that I'm a crazed idiot too, but this film preservation institute has gathered all the material. He's, I don't, he's not an idiot. He's just, he's a fan like I am. And he's collected all the materials of Flip the Frog. He's made them look like they were made last week, and he's got a Kickstarter, and he's always teasing out this Blu-ray that he's going to put out of all the Flip the Frogs. And I follow him online. And so I'm always seeing these excerpts and fragments and cleanups of Flip the Frog. And that includes that the, those cartoons are full of damned and hell. And so I thought to myself, this is interesting. It's 1931 and the telephone yells damn. <laughs> I've got to put that in the book. So that's what Flip the Frog is doing in the book. It was not me researching the word and somehow finding out that there's this ancient terrible cartoon is because that's floating around in my head. So do you, do you, two questions that came to mind about Looney Tunes. Do you have a favorite Looney Tunes character? And do you find, do you find, well, go ahead. And you can answer that Bugs one. Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Oh, Bugs Bunny. There you mm -hmm. go. He's great. 
And do you find Looney Tunes shockingly violent when you're watching it with your kids? I, Looney Tunes is on HBO Go now, you know, and I, so I, I've just been watching a few with my kids recently and I'm kind of like, wow, this is why I like violent movies so much today. I don't know. You know, actually, um, I found with Tom and Jerry that they beat each other up so much that I decided not to show them anymore to my daughters. I thought it is, this, yeah, it's very it's like, disturbing. Like they do everything but bleed. But with the it's Looney true. Tunes, I just, um, I have told them about the guns. I have said in these cartoons, when you shoot somebody with a gun, they, they come out sooty and, and embarrassed. Yeah. But I said, do you two understand that real guns have bullets and they kill people? And I thought maybe they need to know that. I mean, I don't think they're gonna come across a gun, but I thought that was a difference. But it wasn't going to mean I didn't show them the cartoons in their entirety. I just figured this is my lore. But, you know, when Elmer shoots Daffy Duck in the face, that's not how it would really go. And I remember one of them said, yes. And then we just, we just kept walking. <laughs> kept watching. Well, yeah. good, good, to, good to clear the air on that one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to, like, while we're on the pop culture stuff, I've got to mention Lucille Bogan. I don't know that you have to say anything about her. Uh, but I'll just mention to the audience, if you happen to be listening to this, she's like the Megan V. Stallion of 1928. Oh, it's, the, <laughs> it's the same thing. She is a, a, an obscure, although excellent, Black blues singer. She was a big deal in her day, utterly forgotten now. But she cut a few sides, which were only meant to be passed around at parties at the time, but they survived. They're an excellent sound. You listen to somebody in 1935, and she makes her way through almost every curse word in this book used in full fashion. It's not a joke, it's not coy, it's very explicit. And to the point that I can't even quote any of it, but just look up Lucille Bogan. And in particular, there's one song, can I say? Yeah, there's one song called Shave Em Dry. And we don't need to get into what she's talking about, but if you listen to her, have some bourbon before, and you will hear that these words existed in full flower in 1935 because she's using them definitely. Um, so some something else that came to mind here is 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 the appeal of rap music today the same the same as the appeal of profanity? It seems like rap or like phrases from rap music or the feeling it gives people might. Uh, might light up the well you talk at the in the intro of the book about lighting up the right hemisphere of the brain might be might be the same kind of thing you know actually I mean, you talk about comedians and articulate cursing i would say rap is the articulate cursing that most comes to mind for me because a lot of the deftness of those yeah. lyrics is in how all sorts of profanity is openly used and if you ask me it's richer in that way than lyrics used to be able to be. It's truer, and it ends up being a useful tool. It's like learning how to enjoy Southeast Asian food and all those flavors. I like that, that rap can use language as it's actually used. For somebody like me, I can learn about things that I otherwise wouldn't know. And these days, if you are a scholar who studies slang at all, very often the most articulate usages of it are in, in rap music, in my podcast, Lexicon Valley, whenever, I'm trying to get across something about some word, et cetera. I figure the most vivid way of doing this is to play Lil Wayne doing it or something yeah. like that. And especially because many people will be familiar. Yeah, it's a it's a treasure trove and it is very articulate. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. I'm glad we glad we kind of stumbled upon that. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's more so than do you, do you get do you get do you get asked about Tanahisi coats and all these? Do you want to go there? Is that a <laughs> Is that uh... oh, I am. We can talk <laughs> about it, sure. <laughs> well, so I, I stumbled. I stumbled there. You have a long. It seems like you have kind of a ten-year-long yes. polite beef going on, or something. <laughs> is that is that fair accurate? To say? Yes. Um, but I, I stumbled across this because because you wrote a book about rap music called All About the Beat and and the and the arts. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote a review of the book and, and started with a line about being polite to the, polite to the people you disagree with. Uh, so can you summarize what it is you disagree with, you two disagree about? 
I don't think about him much anymore. But yeah, he and I don't like each other. And um, and he and he started it. And it was around that time. All About the Beat was my worst book. I unabashedly say I, I didn't really want to write it. It never went into paperback. It was an utter and complete failure. But when it came out, it was me writing a book about something that people had no reason to think I knew anything about. I knew more, more than people thought. Tanahasi thought, you know, here's this square, you know, I think Tanahasi thought I was a Republican and he's this bad black person and he's going to be writing about this music that I like so much. And I remember he wrote one, I shouldn't admit that I remember after all this time, but I remember around that time he wrote something along the lines of, I haven't read this book yet, but John McWhorter is a bully if he's writing. And I don't think he knew that the book wasn't criticizing the music. But he just assumed that I was writing this pull your pants up book. So yeah, that was what the disagreement was about. And we did a we did a blogging heads talk where we learned nothing whatsoever from one another. And um, here we are today. He and I don't snipe the way we used to. But yeah, there were there were there were some issues, definitely. Yeah, I, I never I, I gotta tell you, before this uh, before reading your book and preparing for this talk, I'd never heard of um, which I shouldn't admit it, maybe, because it makes me sound uncool or something, but I never heard of uh, blogging heads. And I, you know, I stumbled You're not across cool it at all. Because, of, <laughs> because of this talk. And I, I watched a little bit of the Glenn show with you, you and Glenn Lowry. And, and interesting, you know, great, pretty great stuff. So people should check that out, too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So back to the, let, let's see here. Back to the beef with, with codes here. Um, <laughs> I won't. I won't bother quoting you. <laughs> I know what uh, one you're going to use. <laughs> I, I think. Let's see. So I, I think I'm. I'm meaning to use this as an entry point to, to discuss what you're working on now because you're working on a book that you've been calling the elect. But I, I guess it's the same book that is is being published by. Penguin later later this year, and it's mm -hmm. it's now called woke racism. That's been announced how, this week. That's right. Oh, that was announced this week. Mm -hmm. How how a new religion has betrayed Black America. So can you mm -hmm. tell us about the book? Um, well, it's not. It doesn't have anything to do with Tanahasi Coates in particular. But <laughs> that that book is going to be about how our new racial reckoning often results in policy proposals and also just cultural attitudes that I think hurt Black people. That's what it's about. So it's not that I don't like woke. I, I think of myself as pretty woke. I don't like woke people who are mean. And I am seeing a prosecutorial culture that tells us that we're supposed to back things up that I think keep black people behind and condescend to black people. And I don't mean me, I mean black people in general. And so I thought I wanted to have my say about that. And I think that there is a kind of a religious way of looking Things that now that you remind me, a lot of it coalesced around Tanahasi Coates in about 2014. I don't think he was trying to whip it up. He, I think, has moved on to other things and kind of doesn't want to be bothered. But it did all start with people kind of treating him as a guru. And now it's other people who are the gurus, but I really am disturbed by what, what I've seen. And so I just wrote a statement from a black person saying that, do you realize how harmful to Black people a lot of these things are? And so that means two books in a year. I don't know why I did that to myself. But you know, woke racism is coming out around Halloween. And if we're going to name names, ta probably comes up in it three times. Robin DiAngelo and Ibram Kendi up in it a lot more times, because this is a book written about 2020 and 2021. And yeah, it's a constructive book. You know, I don't want to spend a book yelling and screaming but I'm really worried about a lot of stuff that's been happening. And that book is the cranky race commentator me. So Nine Nasty Words is designed to make you smile. Woke racism is designed to make you angry. And so that it's the two sides of me, whatever yeah. those are. Sounds like another potential bestseller, I would say. It's, uh, I have so, no idea. Yeah. <laughs> So something something I've noticed that you've probably noticed too, and I'm I'm like not speaking from an expert, you know, point of view at all on this. I'm like a dorky fiction reader guy, so I'm barely even venturing into nonfiction. 
but uh, but something I've noticed, and I'm wondering what you think about it. Are are white people allowed to agree with your criticisms of the hyper hyper woke and the elect? It strikes me that when you disagree with, say, like a Ta-Nehisi Coates to bring him up again, poor guy, uh, that a certain segment of society is inclined to really enthusiastically agree with you because that same segment of society also agree, disagrees with ta Coates, though maybe more vehemently than you do, and maybe for reasons that are way, way, way less nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I guess the question is, you know, does that make you skeptical? What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I think that my point is not, oh, let's stop this wokeness. You know, I'm not quite yet, you know, the old man shaking his fist saying, get off my lawn. <laughs> my point is stop hurting black people. And so if a white person worries whether they should agree with me, they worry that they're a racist if they agree with me, it'd be an odd conclusion because I, I, what I'm saying is, in a way, you're a racist if you agree with the other people. I'm trying to get that view out there. And so woke racism is not written for people I hate to say this because I'm not trying to dehumanize, but it's not written for car carrying Republican conservatives who watch Fox News. They already don't like the woke stuff. A lot of them see what's wrong with it already. They're convinced. I'm writing to people sitting on the fence who are compelled by a lot of this anti-racist rhetoric because who's against you know anti-racism, but who can see that in practice, a lot of it ends up making black people look delicate, stupid, and numb to nuance not to mention behind, especially in school. And the, their whole issues about race and the cops, well, and I want people to see, you don't have to go for this particular strain of wokeness in order to be a good person. That's what woke racism is about. And it's also about what the black community really needs. And it lists it, there's a chapter about it. So it's not just, I hate reading articles by certain people. It's about, this is what we need to do. So it's an attempt to, be constructive in the conversation and we'll see how it goes so just to not we don't have to dwell on this forever but to, to clear it up for me <laughs> so the the way that anti-racism hurts black people in your view is is um is that it it make turns them into victims kind of thing. But, no but no. you're not but you're oh, not oh no no nothing you're, that ab nothing that abstract no okay because i if, if you okay. get behind a defund the police issue, you're okay. telling people in actual black communities something that they don't want. If you tell people that it's white to be precise and to be on time and to be objective and to like math, mm. it's being said explicitly in many school districts across the country, you are condemning black students to scholastic failure while being told that you are engaging in some kind of anti-racism. It's that kind of thing not just okay. I don't wish to be thought of as a victim. That book has been written 400 times. It's about holding black people back. That's what worries me. Okay. But but you said there are some you're you're kind of there are some policy things that you're in favor of. But you're, okay. Yeah, there are things that need to be done. Just not this stuff that a lot of people are saying needs to be done. We've just maybe, maybe not dangerous the police, but maybe Reform the police. Reform or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So I want to I want to ask one more question about this, and I'll stop making you uncomfortable here. <laughs> okay. But so so the one year anniversary of George George Floyd's murder was two days ago. Uh, it was which was uh, May twenty fifth, uh, and I watched a. I told you I watched a little bit of the Glenn Show. I watched an episode of the Glenn Show from about a year ago. Um, where where you and he talk about the George Floyd thing kind of right after it happened. And um, mm -hmm. and your your view on it at that time, which which may may or may not still be your view on it today, was kind of that it wasn't necessarily about race, but more about socioeconomic mm -hmm. injustice kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um so what what I'm wondering is have your did your views on that change over the last year? Have you have you thought a lot about it over the last year? And um, and we and you know, do you think that police reform is important? I guess, but I think we talked a little bit about that. So. 
Um, no, my views have gotten stronger about that because mm. if I remember the episode that you're talking about, I said, well, for example, you really kind of feel like this is something that wouldn't have happened to a white person. And I just put the question out there, has that ever happened to a white person? And I put it out as a genuine question. And instantly, because of the reach of social media, I learned that there was a white George Floyd. Just four years ago, his name was Tony Jimpa. He was killed in the exact same way, and it was recorded. Nobody ever heard about Tony Timpa. I have since heard from Tony Timpa's family. They are very upset that George Floyd gets all this attention, but when the same thing happened to their son because he's white, it didn't matter. And if you really look at the statistics, what you see is that we have a really effed up cop culture, without a doubt. The cops murder way too many people, but it's not about race in the way that looks so intuitive. And I don't think we have time to talk about it, but even the fact that Black people are killed at a disproportionate rate based on our proportion within the population, even that still comes down to other things. The idea that the cops have a quicker trigger finger with murder on Black suspects, as counterintuitive as it seems, that's just not true. The facts just don't support it. And I really do believe that that's the case. My strategy, cop reform is tough and it's slow. I want to get Black people away from the cops is my strategy. I am very much behind getting rid of the war on drugs, for one thing, because a lot of those things, if it isn't the war on drugs specifically, it's two, three, two or three steps past the war on drugs. It's always the cops are in there looking for drugs. Somebody is suspected of having drugs on them, this sort of thing. That would cut so much of this practically in half, because I'm pretty cynical about how how good you can get the cops to be. And you know, despite Derek Chauvin's conviction, we've seen how easy it is for terrible things to happen, such as what happened you know, in, for, the, for some reason, in Brooklyn, Minnesota, where you have this poor guy, Dante Wright, who gets killed because the cop you know, confuses her taser with her gun. Things like that make me think, let's just not have the cops and Black people meet so often. So I'm very concerned with the issue, but I do look at it differently than many people do. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, I want to. I want to. You've you've given me an hour of your time. You've done a million of these, so I want to end with asking you a few questions that I ask everybody. And it's okay. just I work at a library. So I want to know about the books, you know. So, so I'd call Nine Nasty Words a work of popular linguistics, uh, and that's borne out by the fact that it's a bestseller. So there you go. There can be a work of popular linguistics. I did a. I did a program a few years ago that was one of the, probably one of the most popular programs I've done on another work of popular linguistics, um, Ted McClellan's How to Speak Midwestern. For some reason, people just ate it up. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, um, are there uh, other books of, other books in that vein that you would recommend to readers? Um, I think my favorite, pop linguistics book is um, Bill Bryson's The Mother Tongue about the history of English. If we're talking about, of course, I didn't write. It's Bryson's The Mother Tongue. It's got some mistakes in it, frankly, but boy, can he tell a story. And he pulled off making the history of English as fun as reading a novel. So that's what would first come to mind. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's a good recommendation. Now, what, about, what about books on race that you would recommend? Um, that maybe, is a rich question. Maybe outside, you know, I mean, I mean, because like you said, what everybody's reading and what, what's kind of become almost the biblical. Queen. Are these... The Queen by, the queen. Um, I forget his first name now, Levin. It's about the quote unquote welfare queen. And of course, you know, that Reaganite myth of there being these welfare queens. It was based on this one person. Yeah. Book came out a couple of years ago that ends up being a really interesting story about race in America, and it goes far beyond that myth. Really interesting, really interesting piece of work. That's my favorite race book of the past five years. Great. Thank you. Yeah, never haven't heard of it, so I'll look it up. Um, John McWhorter, appreciate you visiting with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. I'm happy to be here. My battery is about to die because I didn't recharge. And so if I disappear quickly, it's only because of that. But right now I'm still sitting here smiling. All right, perfect. Well, <laughs> thank you and have a, have a, have a great night.